Welcome. So today we start a new Sefer, uh, Sefer Shemais, Pasha Shemais. So before I get into the Pasha, I just want to uh, raise another point, which uh, has to do with Vashti's tale that we spoke about a number of weeks ago. The idea that Midrashim are, are presented to children in their literal form, where most probably that's not what it means, and even if it is what it means, it's not something to tell them because it's going to strain their credulity, they're not going to believe, and they're going to lose their emuna if you tell them stories which they're going to think that, that it's a lie. And if that's what they can think is taira, then to them taira is a lie, so that's going to undermine their emuna. So we have over here another one of these famous cases, which are, in, I guess, in every coloring book and in every, uh, every kid that comes home from the lower gla- uh, grades, it says, Basparo, he went down to the river. You know, they, um, Yecheved took, uh, took uh, Moshe, and she put him in a little, a little uh, basket, and she put him out in the river. And the Basparo, he went down to the river, and Batera Sateva Chasuf, she saw the basket was there uh, in the reeds. Batishla Chasamoso Vatikachel. She, uh, Poshub Shat is, she sent her, her maidservant, she sent her servant to go take him. So Rashi says, It's a Mosa, a Shifchasa. So Rashi says, um, A Medrash, Behem Dorshu, It's a Mosa, it's Yoda. That really it was her hand. Nishtarbva Mosa, Arba, Amis Harbe. Her hand got very long. That means that her, the hand extended and it became like a like a um, hundred feet long, and it reached into the river, this hundred foot hand, and it took the table and it pulled it in, which is like beyond bizarre. And what would have happened with this hand, which like uh, so much more protoplasm and veins and muscles and, and bones reaching all the way out there, and a poor little heart must have been pumping like crazy to pump the blood to the, all the way to the fingers, which are a hundred feet away, and it's a, she must have gotten a heart attack, but maybe that was part of the nest, that she didn't die from the heart attack. I mean, you know, this doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Now, what does it mean? So let's take a talk about this medrash. What does it mean? So I, what I think it means is that, that here you have a, a pampered princess who can't sleep on a mattress if there's a pee under it and can't see beyond her lipstick. And she walks, she's walking, and she's totally absorbed in herself. And, and she sees out there this basket. Now, the word yad, the word yad means a hand. But it also means, the Rambam says in the Moira, and it's really Pashat, Yad also means a reach. A person has a Yad, like, uh, like Yishmoel is Yoda Bakol, Fiat Kolboy, it doesn't mean his hand, it means his grasp, his reach. A person has a Yad in Shas, means he has a grasp in Shas, it doesn't mean that his physically hand is sitting in the Shas. It's a figurative term, but that's what it means, a Yad. So here she has a, the, the Yad of this princess, of this Baspara, it was very limited. But because she saw that Teva, then she had some inspiration, something, she felt something, that she had to do something, and she was able to extend her yad. She climbed out into the river and clambered out herself over, over the, into, into the reeds, and she slept, which was beyond her, beyond her yad. This is not something that she ever did. And her yad, in this case, extended many, many amas more than it normally did. Now, it could be that she clambered out herself, or could be she sent her shifcha to do it, but in either way, it's, it's the extension of her yad. And you see this in Onkelos. Onkelos teaches, batishlach es amoso, you should teach, ushlach yos amsa. The word, the translation of a tishlach, when it's talking about Yaakov sent v'yishlach Yaakov malochem, ushlach malochem, is gadrin, whatever it says there. The word v'yishlach should be shlach. But when it says in, in, in uh, the Akedah, a tishlach yot cho'el alem uma, it says l'soishit. To l'hoishit, that means to extend. When you, when you reach, when you reach out your hand, you don't send your hand, you extend it. 
So when we're talking about a hand, the translation is the hoishit. When you're talking about something else, the translation is ushlach. So over here, over here, um, the uh, uncleus combines the two. Vaishitas yos amsa. She extended her 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 uh, her maidservant. So really, he teaches that it means kipshuta, that it means a maidservant. But he's also putting in that part of the medrash that there was an extension of her reach, and she and the way she extended the reach was by sending her her shifcha, her amma, amsa. She sent her out to get him. But really, it doesn't mean that there was a, an additional. I mean, you see, obviously, that the uncleus is is referencing this medrash. So, you, but it doesn't mean that her arm became a hundred feet long. It doesn't mean that. And even if it does mean that, it's not something to teach. Now, I, I a number of times, I've a couple of times before when I spoke about this. I mentioned the Sefer Hasidim, and I think it's good to say it again. I hope people who are hearing this and really care about uh, the Amunah of their children would mean that maybe go to the go to the school or go to the Rabbeim. I know some Mechalchim came to me and told me that uh, they're upset about this. So maybe they would go to the school and go to the Rabbeim and tell them, please stop telling them things that are going to are make them lose their Amunah. The Hesefer Chidim says, "Aim megalen agoda tmua lektanim." You don't tell a strange hagoda, a strange agadata. You don't tell it to lektanim. Pen yomer aim by mamish. He's going to say it's not true. Umid the whole essay, whole shadvarim nameinam. Since this is not true, then other things are also not true. They won't believe in Kriya Samsov, they won't believe in Maimut Har Sinai. And it's ridiculous to, even if this is true, why would you do such a thing? It's enough that you have to, you have to get them to believe in Kriya Samsov. You have to get them to believe in an, in, in, in an arm that's 100 feet long. I mean, why do that? And Bifrat, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't say for sure, but I'm convinced that's not what it means. Anyway, let's go on until the next time we come up against one of these strange uh, madrashim. And I'll bring this place safer again. I'm going to read it again. I, believe me, I can say these words by heart, but I want to read it from the safer. You should know that, that this is, I'm reading straight from the safer season. Okay. So let's move on. So Moshe is... Uh, he runs away and he ends up in Midian and he's walking in the, in the desert and he sees the burning bush. He sees the snare. And the Rabbi Shalom talks to him from the snare and he tells him that he wants him that he should go to Mitzrayim and take out Kali Yisrael. So Moshe Rabbeinu starts with, uh, raises many objections. So first he says, Who am I? I should go to Paray. I'm not Choshev. He says, I'm not Choshev. Who am I to go talk to, to, talk to Paray? I'm not Choshev. And then he says, What's the second thing Rashi says? What's the second thing Rashi says? What is the schus of Kal Yisrael that they should go out? Now, why, why, does, why does Moshe need to know what... The Ben Shalom is sending him to take Kal Yisrael out. So Moshe says, well, in one, one breath he says, well, he's sending me, I'm not chashed. The other breath, his breath he says, uh, why are you taking them out? What's the schus? Why is, he, why is he asking this question? Why do you need to know? And why are you, why are you, why are you objecting to the Ben Shalom taking them out? out of Mitzrayim. So I think, no, the pshat is, he say, if Moshe Rabbeinu thought that they have no schos. They don't have schos. So if they don't have a schos, then it's the schos of the shliach. So he's saying, first of all, I'm not chashif to go. And second of all, I don't have any schosim to compensate for them. They have no schosim. I'm going to come here. My schosim are, are not good enough to be to, to take them out. So first, I'm not chashif. And second of all, I don't have schosim. That's what he means. He doesn't mean... To, 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 to complain. Okay, so anyway, he says that. So Rabbi Shalom says, I'll be with you. He answers. Then he says, Mashmoi, what? The people are going to ask me, what's Hashem's name? He says, what am I going to say? I'm not going to know what to say. So Rabbi Shalom tells him what to say. And then, then he says, 
Kvat pe, kvat lashon. He says, I can't speak. I can't speak. You know, my people speak, they're not going to understand what I'm saying. So, so first of all, I would think that if, if you want to object, you want to say you, you're not uh, eligible, you're not qualified to be a shliach, the first thing you can say is that when I talk, nobody understands a word I say. So that's the first thing you should say. That I'm a kvat pass. How are you sending me? I'm going to talk and talk, and nobody's going to understand the word I'm saying. And and then, then yeah, so he says, so Aaron will be with you. Okay. Once this is taken care of, then I can say, okay, but I'm not choshev. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to know what to say. But I would think that would be the order. First, you say that that I can't even talk. Nobody understands the word I'm saying. And then you say, I'm not choshev. I'm not going to know what to say. And he did it. The other way around. First he says, I'm not choshev, he says, I'm not going to know what to say. And then finally he's getting to the end, he says, by the way, you know, I can't talk. When I talk, nobody can understand the word I'm saying. So you have to know why, why, why he's saying in this order. Now Rashi says, over here, but this Gamet Muel Gamet Shilsham, Lomadnu, Shekol Shiva Yomim Haya Kodesh Baruch Hu Mephata Es Moshe Besneh, Leilech Bushrichusai, he says, seven days. Yeah, let's go to the Cheshm of Rashi, how he gets seven days. Seven days, the Rabbani Shalom is, is persuading and being Mephata Moshe and trying to get him to go. And Moshe keeps saying, no, it's not good, it's not this, it's not that. What, what is the Pshat of this? What do you mean, the Rabbani Shalom is sending you? And, and every objection that you're going to raise, the Rabbani Shalom knows all your objections. And despite all the objections he's sending you, how's it, you're not telling him anything that he doesn't know. He knows how choshev you are. He knows, uh, he knows that you have to know what to say. He knows that you're a kvat pair. He knows all these things. And he's sending you anyway. So, so what, is, what is the seven days? What are you, what are you, what are you, uh, the, why do you take seven days to, to argue? So I think the Pashto Pshat is that, that, of course Moshe understood that, that uh, Rabbi Shalom is sending him, then all the logistical problems will be taken care of. Of course. But Moshe was saying to him, you know, Rabbi Shalom is sending him on a fantastic shlichus, that he should go and take Klal Yisrael out of Mitzrayim. So what should he say? He should say, of course, me, I'm Elach, Hafez, me, Kara, Yosem, and many, you know, like, uh, of course, you know, okay, I'll be happy to do it, I'll be happy to do it. Moshe understood that that's not what was expected of him. That's not the response that was expected of him. The response was going to be, you'll be, I'm a Chabi, say, no, I'm sorry, it's not for me. That is the proper way to respond to somebody who's offering you a very big covenant. You're offering a big covenant say, sure, you know, you want me to sit in the Mizrach? I'm running. No, you know, it's how we say, you want me to sit in the Mizrach? I don't belong in the Mizrach, you know. I, 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 I'm good where I'm sitting, what's the problem? And even if at the end you're going to end up in the Mizrach, but, but you should end up with reluctance. You should end up because, because, you, because you didn't feel that, it, that you deserved it. You didn't feel that you were worthy of it. So the, what, he, what he was doing every single day was raising reasons why he wasn't worthy. He knew the Rabban Shalom sent him, and he understood that in the end, the Rabban Shalom wants him to go, he's going to go. He's going to go. At the end, when he said, Shlach and Tishloch, and he told them that he should send Aaron, that's when the Rabban Shalom got angry at him, and that was the end of the Maisa. That was the end of his objections. But, but all these seven days, that he was raising all these issues, he was just trying to, 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 to put everything in proper perspective. You're sending me, but you know, you know, you know that I'm not choshev, and why are you sending me? And you know that, that uh, I don't have schusim, that's going to be my, it's a, so and so, and everything in the is a terrorist, I'll be with you, okay, fine, so he answers them. But his job, his job is to be mocked in himself, to say that I that I'm not deserving of this, I really it's not to, not to go running for it, but that's his job. His job is to say that I don't deserve it, and that's what he did for seven days, and 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 um, and that's why he said at the end. There was not it's not a question. All these all the things are not going to matter because everything will have a terrorist. But when you're talking about why you're not why you're not deserving, 
if you say that you're not Choshev, that's a much more fundamental reason why you're not deserving. You say, really, I am deserving. I just have a speech problem. So that's not, that's not what you should start with. You start with, you know, I'm not Choshev. I don't have enough schosim. I don't have the knowledge. I'm going to come there. I'm not going to know what to say. I'm not going to know what to do. All these, th- that's how you should start. And then when you've run out of all these things, like, by the way, you know, I mean, I'm also, I, I mean, I, don't, I can't speak, people, you know. It will be solved, I understand. But Lamai, so you want to send somebody who, who doesn't speak well, so really I don't deserve to go because of that. So really, that was really at the bottom of the list, not at the top of the list. If you're talking about uh, somebody, Stam, somebody sends you on a job, so you say, okay, listen, why are you sending me? I can, I'm not capable of doing the job. But this is, and, and before you get to all, all your other things. But we're talking with the Rabban Shleilam and, and the Rabban wants you to go, and you will go, and you're being mocked in yourself. Talk about what's important first. I'm not Choshev. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to go. And then after all that is finished, then you could talk about, um, you know, your Kvat Peh. So I wanted to point out to you a Balaturim in the beginning of Shemini. He says, "Be'ibiyay ma'shmini kar Moshe la'aron." In the in the in the Yemei Miluim, Moshe Rabbeinu served as the Kohen Gadol for seven seven days. On the eighth day, Aaron became the Kohen. On the seventh day, the first seven days, Moshe Rabbeinu was the Kohen. So so Balturim says like this: "Omar Moshe, the fisha serafti zayin yomim b'sne." Since I objected for seven days by the sne. I was only able to serve for seven days. In other words, if I had lasted for another day, if I had kept up my syrup for the eighth day, then I would have been the Kohen Gadol the eighth day as well. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. Because I, I was, I was Messiah of only seven days, seven days, that's why I only served seven days as a Kohen Gadol in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Miluim of the Mishkan. If I had done more, then I could have been another day. That's what you see. So, so it's very often here in the Balaturim that what he was doing was the right thing. It's what was expected of him. It was a schus for him. And the schus of those doing that, he was like to be Kohen Gadol for seven days. And, and everything that he was doing was exactly what was expected of him. Okay, now, okay. So now you have, in, when, when during this whole uh, dialogue by the snare, Rabban Shalom tells Moshe like this, that you're gonna, that I'm gonna send the Makis, and then they're gonna send them out, and that I'm the people, you're gonna have chen by the people of Mitzrayim, you won't go empty, empty-handed, the small as you're going to borrow all these kind of different kalim. V'nitzaltem es Mitzrayim. What is V'nitzaltem es Mitzrayim? Says Unkelis. Usuroiki nun yas Mitzrayim. You're going to empty Mitzrayim. You're going to empty it. So what does this mean, you're going to empty it? Ketar Gumay Rashi says, Usuroiki nun. Rashi goes into the etymology. But... You're going to empty it. What does it mean you're going to empty it? And what is the Lashen, the Lashen Vinit Saltan? So, the Gemara Brochus brings this Pasek. Well, this says uh, three times. It says here, and that you will. And then in Bay it says twice. He told them, please go ask them for it to borrow everything. And then at the end it says when they left, it says that they borrowed everything and they emptied Mitzrayim. But you're not, so this is, uh, the Gemara is going on the last Pasuk in, in, in Bai. But the other things to talk about in Bai, so I'd rather talk about this here. It's all the same thing. By Yinatsluas Mitzrayim, Omer Avami, Belamed, Shasua Kemitsudo She'en Bodoga. They made um, Mitzrayim like a trap that has no no, no wheat in it. Rashi says, "Derech tzadei oifes lizrik dog on taches mitzudais 
they put they put like some, some grain under the traps, the, the nets, whatever they do. The birds come, they see the they see the grain, they come to the grain, and they get captured. This is Ravami. They make it like the deep water that has no fish. Again, what does Rashi say? That in in the in the deep, in the deep water, there's no food. So I mean, uh, at least uh, okay. I mean, today I think we find that in deep water there are some fish that live there. But Pashtas, there's uh, hardly any fish there. So in the, so on on the more shallow waters, there's food in on the on the floor of the on the seabed. So the fish go there and they eat the food. So you have fish on the shallow water. In the deep water, since there's no food there, you don't there's no fish there. So here we have two ways of saying why what 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 does it mean they made it empty? They made it empty like a trap without grain. They made it empty like like the deep water that has no fish. Now I would think that it's not such a difficult thing to find a marshal for what empty is. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> here's a cup, and look, it's empty. There's nothing in it. You know, what is the, what, what is this? What is so hard to find a marshal for what empty means? Empty, empty. It's n- nothing there. Okay, so there's another Gemara in Psachim. Avkufiu test, the end of Psachim. So he says like this. By Yilakit Yosef, he's going back on a Pesach in in uh, in, um, in the Kates. By Yilakit Yosef, it's called a Kesef Animtza. That means every all the Kesef, all the money that was uh, that was found in Canaan and in Mitzrayim, Yosef collected all the money. He am avudu much more. I'm sorry. Call call Kesef Vizov Sheba Oilam. Every, every all silver and gold in the world, Yosef lekotoi ve'avil mitzrayim. Yosef went and he collected all the silver and gold that was found in the world, and he brought it to Mitzrayim. All, all of the money, all of the silver, all of the gold, he brought it to Mitzrayim. Shenema, by lakat Yosef, it's called a kesef animtza. En le'elo shabaretz Mitzrayim, shabaretz Canaan. Only in these two countries, the pasuk brings only those two countries, Canaan and Mitzrayim. Shararotzis Minayan? How about other countries? How about uh, Syria or Bavel or Libya or who else, whatever else there is? Uh, France? I don't know about France. Talmud Leimer, Vichol Ha'oretz Bo Mitzrayma. Everybody was coming to Mitzrayim. That means the other countries also that people coming to Mitzrayim to buy food. So he collected all the money in those countries as well. He collected everything. When the Yidin left Mitzrayim, imam, they took it along with them. All this money that Yosef collected from all the countries in the, in the whole surrounding area, and he took all the money and all the kesef and all the zav, when Kalisor left, they took it along with them. Shenemar v'inatzlu es Mitzrayim. They emptied Mitzrayim. So, you not the empty Mitzrayim, he took it out. That means all this money that Yosef had collected, piles and piles and piles of, of gold and silver, all this money, when Kansar left, they took it with them. It was lying in their throne until Rechavam. Rechavam was the son of Shlomo Melech. Bo Sheishak Melech Mitzrayim. Then um, Sheishak, uh, the Paris Sheishak invaded Eretz Yisrael and Natolim Rechavam. He came and he took it away. Shanemar, vi b'shon ha'chamishiz Melech Rechavam, ola Sheishak Melech Mitzrayim al Yisholayim. V'yikha chasayitzu b'ez Hashem, v'yitzu b'ez Melech. Took everything. Bo Zorach, Melech Kush, and uh, and the Tolim Sheishak, he took it away from Sheishak. Bo Asa, 
So Asa was was uh, the grandson of Rechavam. He took it back from Zorach, Melech Kush. So it's going, you know, all this, all this, this huge piles of money, cats of his love, they're all moving around. He came to Mitzrayim, moved her to Eretz Yisrael. Sheshach took it away. Zorach took it away from Sheshach. Asa took it away from Zorach. Now what happened then? So now Sheshach has it. Veshigroi, no, no, now Asa has it. Veshigroi ladrima ben Tavrimain. He sent it to, I think, who's this, the Syrian? Bo Amon. So the people from Amon came, they took it from Hadrimon. Bo Cheskia Unetoloi, one second. Bo Yeshofat, so Yeshofat, uh, the Shofat was the son of Asa, yeah. Then told him he took it back from the Amon. For Yemunach Ad Achaz. It was lying by in Eretz till Achaz came. Bo San are you following all these distances? <laughs> move, movement of these these trailer trucks full of full of kesef and zav, okay. And told him achaz, so he took it. So in Sancherev, the Ashur went and took it away from achaz. Bo parsiim talu me kasdiim. So the Persians came and they took it from the Babylonians. Bo yivonim talu me parsiim. Then the Greeks took it from the Persians. Bo Romium, then the Romans came to Lu Miad Yivon, they took it from the Greeks. Vadayin Munach Beraimi. All of this is still in Rome. So, you know. <laughs> what is this? What's going on? So Akalpana, uh, what happened here is by the time the that that it it, it came to Eretz Yisrael, and then and then and then it went out of Red Straw, they went back, and then eventually went out by San Cherev, and by the time the Yavonim came, the Yavonim had it, right? So if we take a look at a Gemara in Sanhedrin, a famous Gemara, that uh, when Alexander, who was Greek, Alexander came to Yerushalayim, so the, so the uh, Mitzrayim came, and they came to Alexander, and they said, and he lent him all these things. Too long to cast of his off. To give me the cast of his off that, that you took from us. Give us, give us all the the, the, the gold and silver that you you borrowed from us when you left. We want it back. So they had the, so so they had a guns to think. What are they going to do? And then they said. So then Gavir ben Sisa came and said. Let me argue. He says, okay, you want us to give you back the Kesel Azov, but, but you have to pay us for all the work that we did. So they, they, so they ran away. That was it. Fine. That was the end of that. Now, this took place during the time of the Yavanim. So they don't have it anymore. The Yavanim took it back. Shishak took it, gave it here, gave it there, went around here, here and there, and, and now the Yavanim have it. So what do you want? You, are, it's, you know, it's not the, the, the Eden don't have it anymore. They, they, you know, they had it for a while, then they lost it, they gave it back. What are you asking for? And then, then, there's, there's another question that I had in, in Pasha's Miketz. When the brothers came back the second time, so the first time, um, Yosef told them to put, uh, he told whoever his people were, to put their money into their sacks. They came back home, they saw that they had the money and they got all upset. What's all this money? What's it doing here? So then they, they, so they brought it back. So they came back and told Yosef that, you know, we brought money for food and the money from before, we brought that too. So Yosef says something like this. Shalom lechem, out here row, don't be worried. Elekeichem velekeichem the, the, the Hashem, that your, the God of uh, your God, the God of your father, he gave you this, this thing, this like secret present that he put into your, that's the money. I have your money. You came with your money, you paid. I have your money. What you found over there was a present from God. I mean, it's a lie. It's not true. We have Mephorish of Sukkim that Yosef told them to take their money and put it back. 
I mean, why is he lying? What's the word? What is he? I mean, besides that, this is like you know, a lie, but there has to be a reason. Why is he making up such a lie? He says, "No, you're, you're. This is, uh, you know, I have your money. This is, this is uh, something Hashem gave you, a mat mine. So, I want to explain what's going on over here, and I'm telling you right now that I don't have the answer all the way. I'm going to tell you what I think is the right shot, but I still need a little help to just make it all the way and I would appreciate if uh, you know my, my email is Yaakov Yosef Ryman at gmail I don't know if anybody can remember that Yaakov Yosef Ryman at gmail and if anybody could offer an explanation I would appreciate it so I think what he's saying is here is like this what is that what is a Mitsuda why is that the marshal for empty a Mitsuda so we're not talking over we, what we're talking about over here is that that Mitzrayim was the imperial power in the region. They were the dominant power. They were the, economically, they had control of the world. They were an economic power. Now, to be an economic power is, is uh, like mo most empires, most, uh, most colonization is all about economy. You want to have uh, countries that will, you could, from whom you could take resources and to whom you could sell things. But that's, uh, the, yes, you have markets. But everything is about economic power. So Mitzrayim had economic power. That means that the Mitzuda, a Mitzuda she'en badogon, Mitzuda is a trap. It pulls in people. It's control. A Matsuda is an, uh, an item of control. It controls the birds. You have a dogon, and the dogon is the lure, and the birds see it and they come, and this way you capture the birds. But the, uh, the Matsula is the shallow water, has control of the fish because it provides food, so it draws the fish to it. So it has control of the fish. Deep water, which has no 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 food, does not draw fish. So this this nitzaltem, the mitsuda, the mitsula, this is a metaphor for economic power. Mitzrayim was the dominant economic power, and when and how did they become this economic power? How did they become? How did they become the dominant eco economic power of of the whole area? I think that Yosef did it. When he collected Vailakit Yosef, as Kola Kesev, the Kola Zov, and all the Rotzes, he got everybody to come down there and to spend their money in Mitzrayim. That's how he gained economic control of all the countries around him. Now, it doesn't mean that he actually, there was no other silver coin and there was no other golden coin anywhere else except for, except for in, 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 the, in, in the capital of Mitzrayim. It doesn't mean that. Money flowed, there was people bought, people sold. But the control of the money, Yosef gained that control of the money. And I think that's what he was telling the brothers. He says, Kaz You came here, you spent your money, so I gained control over your group, over your tribe. I have economic control over them. That's what he was saying. You got your money? Okay, Hashem gave you, gave you matana. How did he give matana? I put it back. That's not important. What's important, he says, is that whatever I wanted, I, I, was, I, I succeeded. I got control over everything. Now, when they left Mitzrayim, they emptied Mitzrayim, the Nitzaltam. They became like a Mitsuda She'em Badogon. Mitzrayim lost its role as the economic superpower. They lost it. How did they lose it? Klali Sroll took it out. How? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But I think that's what's going on over here. That, and they, did, they didn't, Klali Sroll didn't immediately 
replace Mitzrayim as the superpower. It took years, it took hundreds of years. But Shleimah Melech was Melech Bekipa. Shleimah Melech was the dominant imperial power in the world. And he didn't do it with armies or with military. He did it economically with his alliances and his businesses. So Shleimah Melech was, Shleimah Melech was after Mitzrayim, Shleimah Melech was the next, the next king who was the dominant economic imperial power in the whole area. He was Molech Bekipa. After Shleimah Melech, by Rechavam, Shisha came and took it away. So Eretz Yisrael was no longer this, uh, this economic superpower. Now it went back to Shisha. And then this, this power bounced around. It went from Shishak to Zorak to, to Asot, to Adrimain, to the, to the, to the Bnei to the, to, the, uh, to the Babylonians, to the Persians, to the Greeks. And now it is in Rome. It is in Rome. Now you could say the Gemara means that now means at the time of the Gemara is still in Rome. Or you could say it actually means today. Today it's in Rome. Because what is Rome? Rome is the Western, is the Western world. You know, Europe, um, Europe is divided into two parts. The eastern part of Europe is Slavic. The western part is, is uh, German. And all these countries, they're all Germanic. The Germans, the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Burgundians, the Scandinavians, the Ostrogoths in Italy, the Visigoths in Spain, uh, the Irish or the Celtic, which are also closely related to the Germans. America is a German country. The American white people are, are like almost all of them, almost all of them are Germans. So, the, and Germany, this is Edoim. We're in Golis Edoim. So Edoim is Rome. So today, the economic dominance of the world, where is it? It is in the Western world. It is in Western Europe and the United States, which are one thing. So the, 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 the domination of the world is there. This is what the Pasuk this is what the Gemara is telling you. Now, Alexander, when they came to, to ask for the stuff back, they were asking for the sacks of bechers and lachters and, and bracelets and necklaces. That's not what the Nitzaltim is. And actually, the Gemara in Sanhedrin doesn't mention the Nitzaltim. It just mentions Vayashilum. They came for the stuff, for the stuff that they, that they borrowed. They wanted it back. Shishak never took it back. She should, he didn't bother with the, with, the, with, the, with the stuff that they borrowed from the neighbors. That wasn't what Shisha came for. He came for economic domination. When he came there, he broke the economic power of Eretz Yisrael, and he replaced Eretz Yisrael as the dominant economic power in that part of the world, which is basically the most important part of the world. That's all of the world. So this is, this is the way I understand this. Uh, I don't know how this happened. Was it something like der Hateva, or is it some kind of economic uh, principles that, <laughs> that govern this? I don't know. And if anybody can help me out, I mean, assuming that, I, I think that's really what it's about. Otherwise, it just makes no sense. So it is about domination. It is about Mitsuda she'en Dagon. The Mitsuda dominates. Economic domination draws in everybody, controls everybody. When you pull out the Dagon, it becomes, you know, emasculated. It has no power anymore. So that is what happened. That's the Nitzaltem. Nitzaltem, what, something happened, and I don't know what it is, and I don't have any explanation. Okay, that takes care of this. If anybody has an explanation, I would really be very grateful, because, you know, I'm, uh, it's many years that I, that I, I'm, I have no shot in this, in this, uh, in this Gemara. Okay, I just want to conclude with one thing. Um, we know Moshe was like the greatest leader that Klal Yisrael ever had. He came to Mitzrayim, he took Klal Yisrael out of Mitzrayim, which is something magnificent, really. But why is it so magnificent? What did Moshe do that you and I couldn't have done? And the Ben Shalom had sent you to Mitzrayim. Everything Moshe did was scripted. Every word he said, every movement with his hand, every movement with his stick, everything that he did, the Rebbe told him, 
pick up the matter, do this, do that, go to Paroi, say this, say this. Everything was exactly, he was told exactly what to do. So what was extraordinary about what Moshe Rabbeinu did? What was so great about it? I mean, it was, I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm saying it was unbelievably great. But what was the greatness of it? What was it? So there's a Rashi that really holds the key. After, Moshe, after, uh, after the snare, so Moshe goes back to Yisrael and gets permission to go. And then says, So Rashi says, Listen to these words. Da, you should know. This is why you're going. You should be strong in my shlichus. Last is called Moivsai Lifnei Farai to do all my Moivsim. The Loi Sira Mimenu. Don't be afraid of him. That's what it was. If Moish Rabbeinu had stood before Parai and had felt the least tremor of fear in his heart, and it was scary, you know, with his warriors and his lions and his whatever other creatures he had over there, and it was like a very scary situation. And Moshe Rabbeinu was coming with the shlichas to Rabbeinu Shleilam. If he would have felt the slightest fear in his heart, the shlichas would have been bottled, because then para is also something. The whole point is that Enoid Malvadoi, his Rabbeinu Shleilam, para is nothing. And if para is nothing, then you can't fear him. So that's what, you, your, that's what your shlichas was, to be a gibur, and not to have the slightest bit of fear. To walk into that lion's den, to walk into that paroi, and everything, and all his intimidations, and don't feel any fear. Because if you would have felt any fear, it would be felt. And that would mean that there's, there's two, there's Hashem, and there's paroi, and there's not. So the whole success of the shlichas depended on his loisira mimen. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He was able to go, and he didn't have not even a trace of fear in his heart. And that's why he was successful. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you again next week.